Semester one, we looked at how Islam, Iman, and Ihsan have been understood, preserved, and transmitted. This semester, we will look at the factors that shape our understanding of Islam in the contemporary world. For the first semester, <coughs> do you remember, we looked at for nine weeks how Islam, Iman, and Ihsan have been understood and how they've been preserved through the relevant sciences. Uh, Islam through the four madahib, <laughs> Iman through the schools of, of, of Aqeedah, one of the schools of Kalam, the Ashara'ira and the Madhuridiyya, and uh, the Hanabila, those who do Tafwid, <coughs> not the Mujassama from amongst them, and the Ihsan as understood through a Tasawwuf, or an Inna Shara Sufi, which has historically been the science through one, one uh, reaches Ihsan and Ta'abudullah and the Qatar. And then how that's been translated. That's all from last semester. And then we said that this semester we're going to look at the factors that shape our current understanding of Islam in the modern contemporary world. Faith is based on knowledge, so be careful from where you take your faith from. Okay, your faith. Your Islam is based on the knowledge that you take. So you have to be careful where you take your knowledge from, because if you take your knowledge from the right places, the right sources, then your faith will be correct. Should you take your faith from the incorrect sources, your faith will be? Incorrect. Taking knowledge from unqualified sources can have devastating results in this world and the next. ISOC committees who are responsible for educating students should be extra wary of this as they are responsible for the decisions they make in front of Allah. Who do you take your knowledge from? So, the people who are responsible for educating other Muslims who have a responsibility, they are It's more dangerous for those people. Uh, anybody who is who's responsible for educating other people, if you yourself aren't educated in Islam or not sufficiently educated, then what hope is there for you to educate other people? You see? And if you're miseducated, all right, what do I mean by that? I mean that like your understanding of Islam uh, uh, has some defects, arguably, then that's going to be passed on to other people. That's problematic. That's Because if you don't know who to take your knowledge from and you're responsible for educating other people, then no longer are you kind of responsible and you're not here for yourself, which you are, but you're also responsible for other people's understanding of Islam because you have opened the door. Now, the opposite is also true. <clears throat> Should you open the door of khair for people to understand their faith correctly, you also gain the reward. The opposite is also true. If you open the wrong understanding, you gain the sin of that. <clears throat> Alright, situation we find ourselves today. We now know that the vast majority of Muslims for the vast majority of time have followed one of the four madhabs, the Ashari Maturidi schools in Aqidah have followed, accepted the importance of the Sawa Sufism as a science. Only a handful of innovative sects that have not. Nothing new there, that's been, been proven uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt, historically. If this has been the case, why then do we find so much opposition, criticism and rejection of the following a madhab, the Asharis and Sufism from 
Some family members, friends, communities, mosques, universities, ISOCs, online social media, TikTok, Instagram, satellite TV, stations, as well as Islamic bookshops. Show of hands from the audience, please. Is this true? Yes. No. Hands up, hands up high. Hands up high. Keep your hands up. And the sisters are all hands up. Do you understand the question? No. Okay, wait a minute. Sisters first, ladies first. Do you understand the question? We've established historically that the majority of Muslims for the vast majority of time have followed one of the four Malayah and have followed the Ash'ari or the Mayafi school, the vast majority, the vast majority of time, and have followed and accepted the importance of the soul. That's been proven historically with about nine weeks during the last semester. You with me so far? Question. If that has been the case, why do we find so much opposition? and criticism and rejection of following a method <clears throat> of the Ash'ari school, an example, and Sufism from, an example, from some family members, friends, communities, mosques, universities, Islamic societies, online social media, TikTok, Instagram, satellite TV stations, mostly in Arabic, uh, as well as some Islamic bookshops. And <clears throat> I'm saying, Show of hands from the audience, please, if that is your experience. Back to the guys. Hands up high. Let the jury know that everybody's put their hands up apart from one or two. And the sisters, hands up high. Okay. One, two, three, four. About half. Okay. As I Is this not a cause of division and weakening of the Ummah? What do you think? Based on today's uh, events, what do you think? Uh, it is, yes. But again, like our parents, the government. We we'll have a question at the end, sorry, you're new, I should have told you. The questions at, at, uh, at the end, inshallah, we can do it, sorry. You're new, so you have an excuse. Inshallah, not anymore. <laughs> you we'll have the questions at the end, inshallah. And more importantly, What has happened in our history that has led, the, led to this being the case today? What, what has happened in our history that this is the case? That we are seeing things which should be, I mean, musallamat, we should be haram, there's nothing to argue <coughs> over. But now we're arguing over just very established kind of principles that our grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents didn't have to argue over. But why are we now like, what's happened? Is that not a good question? Because I think that's very important, and that's what I'm going to spend the bulk of this semester looking at. Because I think it's important for you to know. What factors are shaping people's understanding of Islam in the contemporary world? So, if we're saying, and I, I myself uh, have well worked in the field of da'wah for 20 something years, that's still the case. That madahib, I'm Still finding people arguing against following the method, following the method in the, in the correct way. The Shai school not being the correct way, and Sufism just all kind of criticisms. What's going on? If historically that's what the Ummah has been on, <clears throat> then why? What's happened today? Why are we now arguing about history? Or like a whitewashing? Maybe that's a better term. Whitewashing of our history. <coughs> to begin to understand the factors that shape our understanding of Islam in the contemporary world, we need to look at our history for the answers. Are the forces that divided us in the past also dividing us now? Are the forces that divided us in the past also dividing us now? And why is that, why is that the case? And you can argue who's behind that? There are many factors and reasons, some complex than others, but I will aim to focus on a few for the purpose of these lectures. So it's a lot more complicated that I am putting out there, but for the purposes of where you guys 
where I want to take it, I'm going to keep it very simple. Alright? Because it can be, it's a lot more complicated. Someone can argue, that is, is oversimplifying it. And I am. Because I don't think I need to complicate it anymore for you guys. It's already complicated as it is. But just like I'm going to open up this can of worms for you to see. No, we are looking at we are looking from the viewpoint of Sunni Islam. Other forms of Islam will differ. So Sunni Islam is the context through which we are exploring this topic. Other forms, other interpretations of Islam will differ. And that's, that's, we have no problem with that. But I'm specifically looking from the Sunni perspective. Starting point, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, term used to designate mainstream Sunni Orthodox Muslims and their beliefs, defined by scholars historically as. So this term, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, historically, the definition has been agreed upon by the vast majority of our scholars and recently endorsed by Azhar University uh, several years ago uh, and a whole bunch of other Sunni scholars uh, recently just to reinforce it, is this. Those that follow one of the four schools of fiqh, the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, and Hanbali schools. One of the schools of Aqidah, namely the Ashtaris, Maturidis, and the non-anthropomorphists of the Athari, Ahl Hadith, Hanbali, who do Taqwir. Those that follow a path of Ihsan, the Sawwuf, that is grounded in the Quran and Sunnah. This has been what the vast majority of Muslims for the vast majority of time have followed. This is attested to by history, as seen by Al Azhar's approach to learning and their fatwa and their definition. <coughs> so, Azhar University, <coughs> the oldest Sunni Islamic university, and there's others, I'll just take, take this as an example. In their syllabus, they will follow one of the four schools, they'll teach you one of the four. And in Aqidah, the, the, either Ash'aris or Maturidi, in Aqidah, well known. And they, and they will be teaching some kind of spirituality of the soul of Sufism. That's like the Oxford and the Cambridge and the Harvard of the Islamic world. That's the syllabus. Uh, you don't believe me? Go look for yourself. Okay. So the definition of Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and this is taken from the Shafi'i school. Those who are Shafi'i should not find any fault in this if you are truly a Shafi'i, but that's the definition of Qudri ibn Hajr al haytami as a fatwa in the Shafi'i school, what is Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah? It's this. Wait, yeah. Focusing on leadership according to Ahl al-Sunnah. In this lecture, we are going to explore what Ahl al-Sunnah says about the position of leadership. This is known as the Imam Caliph, Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen, leader of the faithful. <laughs> We are going to explore the first leaders of Islam, Al Khulafa Al Rashidin, the righteous caliphs, how their, how their leadership was established, and the conditions set out by Ahl Sunnah on this. Is the topic of leadership, Khulafa, an, Khulafa. an issue of fiqh or aqidah? What difference does it make? Right, <clears throat> let me give you a minute or a few minutes to think about that.
can't talk between yourselves. It's going around so. Hey, are you going to post you? On this topic. I'm not going to post you. So, after much Bismillah. What? <coughs> what have you? We just said hands up. Not men. Before we let the mic up. There is many. Not men. Is the topic of leadership of Khilafah an issue of fiqh or aqidah? I'd say a bit of both. Because, like, if your belief of leadership um, makes gives you like an ego in a sense that would you know you know got a bit you know extends. And what I'm saying, sorry, is that do the scholars, the ulama, do they consider the issue, the topic of leadership, an issue of fiqh rulings or an issue of aqil and belief? I'd say it's fiqh mostly. Fiqh mostly. Sisters, fiqh. <coughs> Anybody want to say aqil? Huh? <coughs> no one's hand up high. What difference does it make? Is that a more important question? What difference does it make? Because if it was a fiqh issue, you would have to refer to the four madhabs, and if it was an aqidah issue, you'd have to refer to the ashaira or the maturidiya. That's true. <coughs> that is true. Uh, practically speaking, well, you're right, you're right, right? If we're saying the issue of uh, of aqidah, then failure to believe in the right thing would mean what? In your faith. Hands up. Would mean that? Who said that? Hands up? Your hand up? Is it like if the kufr like. Ah! That's the that's that's difference, right? If we're, if we're moving leadership out from fiqh and placing in aqidah, belief or creed, then not believing in it affects your aqidah, your creed, which in theory, worst case scenario, can take you out of the fold of Islam. That's the point. I'll repeat it again. The issue of leadership in Islam, the khilafah, is an issue of fiqh or an issue of aqidah. And what difference does it make? Well, if we're going to say it's an issue of <coughs> fiqh, it's rulings. And like Zuhair said, we go back to the four schools. 
الانكفيشن اوف عقيده لم يكون ذلك من اوض الاشاعره انا ما تريديه وذا فيلد تو بيليف ان رايت اندرستاندينغ اوف ذا خلافه ان يو عقيده ذن ذير سمثينغ اوف يور فيث ان ورست كيس ات تيك يو اوت اوف الاسلام اور بيست كيس ان ذا نوبي بيست كيس بيست كيس You know, is that you still believe in Islam, but you, you are an innovator, a muqtada. You innovated something that's not part of our faith. So the question remains, is an issue that the scholars of fiqh have dealt with, or, in, or the scholars of aqidah? If you were to open up the books of the, of the four schools, or the Shafi'i school, for example, would you find a chapter there dealing with uh, uh, the Khilafah? How to establish a caliphate, how to establish a leader, the conditions of a leader, so on and so forth. Or would you find that in the books of Aqidah? Well, what's that pillars of Iman? Al Kali Iman. I mentioned last time I said the six pillars of Iman is what? Hands up. And don't remember that to be Allah. Next? Angel. And don't remember that. Well, Malaka Kiti, eh? Angel, then? Books. And the prophets and the messages, then? In the books. Yeah. And then? Huh? Ah, yeah, the last day. And the six? Destiny. Qadr. Fate. Is it a seventh? No. What did the prophet say? Six, right? Only six. Is it a seventh? No. Is leadership in there? No. Is the khilafah in there? <coughs> no. Do you get my point? That's massively important. In ways you won't really understand until we go on more of these classes, and you understand a lot more. But I don't really have the answer. Maria, what do you think the answer is? Ahl Sunnah. And I mentioned Ahl Sunnah specifically, say that it's an issue of fiqh and the four Malayim that deal with this issue, and not an issue of Ahidah. According to Ahl Sunnah of the Jama'ah. Alright? So the issue of Ahdeen. So you pick up your medium to, to advance the book and fit in Shafi'i school, for example, you'll find a whole chapter towards the end, like the Reliance of the Traveller, that has a, 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 a talk about the Khilafah and governance. Right? You won't find it in the books of Ahdeen. Alright? Except the very brief uh, 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 mentioning. For reasons we'll explain later on uh, throughout these classes. Mm, I see. Some sects have made it an issue of creed, a theta, upon which your Islam is either valid or not. That's what I mean to say. Well, some sects, not a hell of a Jama, have taken it out of fiqh and rulings and placed it in the realm of aqidah. Okay? Which the Prophet never did. And therefore, your belief now can be targeted if you don't subscribe to a particular belief in who is should be in charge, who's a leader, and so on and so on, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But this is where I'm going to take the direction of these classes in order to answer the question, which is what? What are the factors that are affecting our contemporary understanding of Islam? You may not see it right now, but the dots will become clear and you'll connect them very quickly for yourselves. Listen again, follow. The companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had taught his companions everything that he had been commanded to by Allah. The Sahaba had seen the highest form of human perfection in his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam example as a teacher, father, military and political leader, husband and most of all a prophet. Future lectures next year will focus on this detail in detail. Naturally, the Sahaba who lived, travelled and sat with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in times of difficulty and ease all absorbed some of his qualities. As a result, Ahl Sunnah say that the companions reach the highest levels of human perfection outside of, outside of prophecy and messengerhood. <coughs> so, as a result of that, Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah says that the Sahaba reach the highest levels of human perfection 
possible outside of prophecy. They weren't prophets. All right? Prophets uh, have a whole rank in themselves. Outside of prophecy, outside of the prophets and the messengers, the highest rank were the Sahaba. That's what the Sunni Aqeedah uh, believes in. He وسلم, was the best teacher and had left the best pupils for mankind to teach and spread the message of Islam. You judge a teacher by his students. <coughs> so the Sahaba, the Prophet left the best teachers to teach us. Alright? And if you want to measure a student, you look at their teacher. Alright? How you measure students, look at their teacher. And who was the teacher? of the Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I believe a great deal of students are, um, are starved of these kind of realities. A great deal. Uh, looking at what kind of um, things are going on online and kind of the talks that ISOC and other country are kind of involved in, this is the missing. This kind of any focus on the Prophet, his mannerisms, his akhlaq, and, the, and the, the characteristics of the Sahaba, it seems to be missing. That's, my own, that's what I'm seeing up and down the country. I think it's really, I mean, at a very deep spiritual level, I don't see this. And, you know, you guys suffer, which is, which is sad. So next year, we'll try and um, do something about it at this university, inshallah. Hallmarks of Ahlul Sunnah. Do you know what hallmarks means? Seriously. Oh, uh, key okay. key ah, key features. Key features. A distinctive feature of Ahl Sunnah is their deep respect and love for. So we've got the hallmarks. You, the other one, you can use that. Is it better? Is it better? Oh. I'll sort it in a second. No worries. The hallmarks, or as many have said, the key features, the key features of the Ahl al wa with regards to this topic, is their deep respect and love for all the companions of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nothing new, right? But number two, as well as his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his own family known as Ahlul Bayt, the people of the household. And this includes those who were Sahaba from the Prophet, yeah, and those that came after, up until the present day. So a key feature of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah is their deep love, respect, reverence for all the companions. And the reality number two is in number one, right? Somewhat, you could argue. But number two actually broadens it, the Ahl al-Bayt, the family of the Prophet those who were Sahaba and those that came after Ahl al-Sunnah wa jamaah in their works, in the tradition of a thousand years, you will find that they have a love for all Sahara and they have a love for the Ahl bayt These two things are in balance. This is massively important going forward. Because what you're going to find in this day and age, you'll find some people will play, place an emphasis on one while not talking about the other, and vice versa. So there's an imbalance. But Ahl al-Sunnah and Jama'ah, these two are 50-50, two wings of the same bird. We're going to move on, inshallah. The slides will be available. Is Jubei here? No. Bismillah. The merit of the companions. Allah had chosen the best people to be the companions of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Great examples such as Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Khadija, Aisha, Bilal, Zubair, Talha, Muawiyah, Ibn Abbas, etc. As children, we grow up hearing about them. 
in khutbahs, books, lectures, etc. We refer to the messengers' wives as the mothers of the believers. Consequently, Ahlul Sunnah will say, May Allah be pleased with them whenever their names are mentioned. Radiallahu anhu anha anhuma anhum. Some of them were closer to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than others. Okay. Ayla. Due to their knowledge, piety, time spent with him, family ties, when they took their Islam, and the level of sacrifices they made for their faith. Naturally, they, there existed various ranks of merit amongst the Sahaba, two of which are worth us being familiar with. Al-Muhajirun, the emigrants, and Al-Ansar, the helpers. So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the best people to be the companions of the best of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And amongst the Sahaba, the thousands of them, some of them had a closer uh, a relationship with the Prophet than others. That was natural. Some were married to him, some weren't. Some were very close to him, more than others. But all Sahaba, or some had more time, learned more, uh, 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 spent more time with him, lived with him than others. So therefore they had, they were privy to a greater exposure to the Prophet But outside of that, in terms of the, in terms of the Sahaba, there are two great uh, groups of Sahaba that we should, really should be familiar with, especially going forward uh, in these lectures. And they are the Al Muhajirun, the immigrants, and Al Ansar, the helpers. Who are they? Al Muhajirun, the emigrants, and Al Ansar, the, helper, the helpers. Two groups of Sahaba existed. The Muhajirun, those that emigrated from Mecca to Mecca <coughs> due to the persecution, were from the tribe of the Quraysh. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and many of the earlier converts, including the Prophet Sallallahu family, Ahlul <coughs> So, the group of Sahaba called Al-Muhajirun, alright, the name tells you all, because they migrated from Mecca to Medina, very early on, due to the persecution. And they evolved, and they're mostly from a tribe called Quraysh. Mostly from a tribe called Quraysh. I put it in red, because that's very important going on in today's lecture. And they include such luminaries and great names as Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and many of the earlier converts, male and female, including the Prophet's family, Ahl Bayt. So when you hear the name Al Muhajirun, it's not this sect that lives that's down London, up in the country that I've been talking about for the past 30 years. Have done nothing and contribute towards extremism. Not that group. Al Muhajirun. That's I think I have to be Al Muhajirun, alright, in our classical sense, are these people. You understand that? Al Muhajirun. Right. If we now move on, the second group of Sahaba that we should be familiar with are the Ansar. Who are the Ansar? The Ansar, the helpers. Who were from the people of the, who were the people from Medina that took in the Messenger وسلم, and the Muhajirun that left Mecca and gave victory to Islam. So if you can imagine, the Sahaba left Mecca from the, from the persecution. Right? They are called what? That group? Muhajirun. Muhajirun. And they get to Medina. And the people in Medina welcome them in and look after them and give them refuge. Those in Medina who took their bin are called Al Ansar. We get it. All right, very important. These names are important. If you want to make a note, make a note. Al Muhajirun, Sahaba, from Mecca, who moved to Medina. Al Ansar are those who gave them help, the helpers, because they helped them. Right? Both groups of Sahaba have high rank and gave the Messenger وسلم, and Islam victory with their wealth, time and lives. The Prophet وسلم, loved them both and spoke about their features and qualities. Ahl-Sunnah and the merit of Sahaba 
With regards to the rank of the Sahaba, Ahlul Sunnah have agreed the best of them in rank are as follows. Who is that someone to ask you? Um, according to Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah, who is the best of the Sahaba in rank? To order them in rank, the traditional classical works of Aqidah, uh, the Ashra'ira and the Ma'atidiyah, for example, will have them laid out like this. Number one, the four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. This is in order of merit. The ten Sahaba <laughs> that have been told that they are from the inhabitants of heaven. Al-Ashim al those ten Sahaba the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told you are from Jannah. Huh? You're going to heaven with ten of them. The participants in the Battle of Badr. 313. <laughs> Participants of the Battle of Uhud. Those who gave allegiance, Bayah. The rest of the Sahaba. And that's taken from a book called uh, Tariq al Khulafa by an Imam al um, I'm aware there is a translation. I don't know how good that translation is. Allah uh, alam, I have the Arabic uh, book of it, inshallah. So, Who's at the top of the Sahaba then, in terms of merit? According to uh, the information we have uh, and what was understood from the Prophets uh, 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 indicate, indicating in terms of the best of Sahaba, we take that, who is the best at the top? In terms of outwardly, what we know, it'd be who? At the top of all that list, who's number one? Right at the top? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. And then Uthman, then Uthman, and then Sayyidina Ali. <coughs> Okay? That's uh, the classical Sunni Orthodox position. Again, some forms of Islam would differ. We're not talking about them, we're talking about Sunni Orthodox. <coughs> the greatest disaster the Ummah faced. Bismillah, let me ask you a question. If I was to ask you what was the greatest, or is the greatest disaster the Ummah ever faced? Sister, the greatest disaster. Sister with the blue heart, what was it? What do you think the greatest disaster? There's too many to pick from. What do you think the greatest disaster this woman has ever faced? What's your name, Sonny? Malika. 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 What, what do you think? Just the next few. With the other blue bottle. Sophie, Sophie, right? No, no, we don't. Sophia. Sophia. Okay. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. Anybody else? Would you agree with that? The greatest disaster this Ummah ever faced was the passing of the Prophet. No, I agree. Yeah. Amir agrees. Who yeah. agrees? The death of the Messenger وسلم, was the greatest disaster that the Ummah had faced. Historically, when the charismatic founder of a new religion dies, that religion usually suffers a severe crisis of authority because the founder's inspiration or direct tie with God is lost. Can you imagine that? Remember, there's a hadith, especially in the Riyadh al-Salihim, in which the Sahaba are saying they realize that their connection to heaven's gone. With the link to direct link <coughs> to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gone. That the message from the heavens is coming down, <coughs> coming down to the earth is finished. When the Prophet passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the direct contact to Allah in terms of divine revelation is finished. No more divine revelation. There's no more specific guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's finished. What's there is there. That's been a disaster, right? Because then we're kind of, well, what we've got is enough. But it, it, is, it, is a, it is a disaster. When the Prophet passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because we know that the Sahaba didn't really think that was going to happen. As we know from the Umar ibn Khattab's uh, uh, response, inshallah. Right? Most small new religions collapse as a result or continue in a weakened form only to vanish later. 
This was not the case with Islam. Why? Why? Maryam. Sister, Nick, one next to Maryam. What's your name? Asma. Asma. Why? What do you think? Because we restore it to a lot of people. Alright, okay. Restore it to a lot of people. But you can argue uh, um, fascism or what else is it? Communism restored to a lot of people. That's kind of died out somewhat. Luqman. Because Allah said that um, He's going to preserve Islam. Okay. Allah has promised to preserve this deen. And preserve this deen, He subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu has. Why? Why is that the case? Why is it just mentioned that? Islam is the last revealed religion, and Allah's promise to preserve it, as Muhammad correctly said. <clears throat> How do we now overcome the disaster which is the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Can you imagine now? The Prophet's no longer there. Who's in charge? Who do we go to now for guidance? Right? Who's, who's authority? Let's see. And that's what, that's what faced the Sahaba. How they overcame this disaster, and what you see, and the way to look at this part of history is that Allah is preserving this being. So that's the way to really look at it. According to Ahl Sunnah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had not specified, appointed a particular leader, Imam Caliph, by no. name to succeed him after his death. I've put this in bold. Because it is such a it's such a vital point that distinguishes Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah from other uh, 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 interpretations or other sects of Islam. This is very key, a key, a foundational principle within Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, according to the Sunni tradition, had not specified or appointed a particular leader by name, to succeed them after his death. That's what Sunni Islam believes. All right? Very important. Again, these slides will be available at the end, inshallah. When Jabal gets it. Should we get it? No, it's recording for it. You're recording for it. A sign of true faith is that it has the ability to maintain its continuity and survival after the death of its founder. Again, Allah has promised <coughs> to preserve this deen. Alright? So, Allah, if the Prophet is no longer there, Allah is there. Alright? Allah is going to look after this deen. The Prophet is no longer there, but the Prophet is, uh, the Prophet is no longer there, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. It was left to the great companions <coughs> themselves to appoint someone based on what the Messenger وسلم, had told them. The great Sahaba had spent years with the Prophet ﷺ, benefiting and embodying his example and way. They are the best of generations, the best of people, great men and women who had perfected their inward and outward realities. Ahl Sunnah defined a Sahabi companion as whoever met the Messenger ﷺ, believed in him and died as a Muslim. So if somebody asks you, what's the definition of a companion, that's what it is there. Whoever met the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam who met him and believed in him took shahad and died as a Muslim they are considered sahaba you are considered a sahaba that's the definition so if you didn't meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam but you became Muslim you had met him you went from the sahaba a Sahabi is one who met the Prophet in person, alright, sat in front of him and believed in him and died as a Muslim. If you met him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and took shahada, but died as a non-believer, which a very small minority did, you're not considered from the Sahabi. You are not considered from the Sahabi. Right? Right, uh, give me one second. 
اهلا وسهلا يا مرحبا السلام عليكم وجه ساكي دبي والله I'm going to give you a break from my curl voice and you can hear my passwords instead. Yes. Maybe you can turn it down. Yes. Okay. Just bear with my fire in the right. Anyway, whoever had uh, Imam to provide the list of it was a prophet and he did not know it's very that resulted in So basically, I am really weird watching myself here. I'm going to uh, um, explain how Abu Bakr uh, became the, the Khalifa in the shop. This is not your slides. By the way, so um, take his notes, uh, inshallah. But this is uh, how, according to the Sunni tradition, how Abu Bakr became uh, the Khalifa. So I'm going to just um, uh, read to you, inshallah, uh, what happened that particular day. So the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he passed away, uh, there's a famous incident called uh, Asafifa, the famous incident that resulted in the bay'ah, the allegiance of, uh, of the first Khalifa Abu Bakr, the Allah be accused And Umar al Khattab describes what happened uh, many years later in, 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 when he became the Khalifa, during his time, he described exactly what took place. This is very important for us going forward to know this. And Umar mentions that that when uh, that the Ansar, who are the Ansar? The helpers. The helpers, and they're from Medina. Medina. That the Ansar had gathered in a particular place after the death of the Prophet, very early on. I mean, at this point. The Prophet had now been his body of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi being prepared for the burial. Okay, and those who were preparing his burial of his family, Umar and Ali, and the father of the household. Okay, Ali, as we know, was married to and the Prophet's daughter, Abu Basakhar, Abu Musa. So the Ansar were gathered, and for the purpose of electing who was going to be a uh, leader. Okay. And the issue here was that when Umar ibn Khattab heard about this and came to his attention, he knew, and as well as all the Sahara from um, uh, immigrants in Muhammad, but the Prophet has specifically mentioned that the leaders or the imams and imam are from Quraysh. It's a hadith, Sahih hadith. When the Prophet is saying, sallallahu alayhi wa this says, that the leaders, the leaders are from Quraysh. Which indicates that the leader is from Quraysh, and Quraysh is a tribe from the uh, al When When the Sahaba, this is a very difficult time, the Prophet just passed away. Umar al Khattab, when he heard that the Prophet passed away, when the news came to him, he took a sword out and said, anybody who said the Prophet is dead, I'm going to chop the head off. Okay, so all these emotions going through their minds. Okay? But at this time, I don't know about Abu Bakr. I don't know who knows what Abu Bakr did. I don't know who did all the time. Abu Bakr then mentioned the verse of the Quran that he worshipped Allah. And I know that Allah never did. He worshipped the Prophet Muhammad, not that he's dead. And he worshipped Allah, not that Allah is living or dead. 
of the Ulama who probably heard that, he came back to his senses. He said it was as if that was the first time I'd ever heard that verse of Quran. Despite it not being the first time, but it was it sank in. As if it was the first time I'd ever heard that verse uh, being recited before. Anyway, so the Ansar of Galif and about to appoint a Khalifa. And this was an issue because the Prophet had already mentioned during his lifetime that the leader would be from Quraysh. That's as far as, far as the prophet as the prophet specified. That from his tribe, well, essentially from the Muhajirin. So the Sahaba, when they heard about this, they went to uh, this area with a gallant and to discuss this issue. Uh, and Robert mentions that this uh, election should be. And uh, it should be through consultation. That uh, people should be consulted first before a leader is uh, appointed. And Abu Bakr Umar says, Abu Bakr was from the best amongst us. Uh, so Umar says, Abu Bakr was from the best um, amongst us. <coughs> when the Prophet died. But however, Ansar had gathered to elect somebody uh, amongst themselves. So basically, he's saying that Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr is. You know, all the uh, So the Muhajirin gather in this place and they, they go and they find uh, the Ansar, the Allah be pleased with them all. And Umar said that uh, amongst the Ansar is a particular companion called Sa'ad ibn uh, Rubad. And Umar comes in with the rest of the Sahaba and he finds that before the Sahaba now uh, there's a, a particular companion called Sa'ad ibn Rubad who's giving a speech. Uh, and you know, basically saying why he thinks he himself should be a uh, leader. But this time that there was no way, this is the first time they're doing this. Alright? First time that it's never been done before. So they kind of had uh, ways of electing leaders before, they kind of used some of these ways that they had before. So Sa'ad so ibn Abad now is giving a speech uh, and he's praising the Ansar. Medina, and saying that uh, how they perhaps are more deserving uh, of being a leader of the Prophet amongst themselves, obviously indicating himself in that process. And that the Muhajirin, those who emigrated, that you know, yes, they're great, but we have a greater uh, right. Okay. And Robert says, you know, I have heard a beautiful speech, a very beautiful. And Umar said, I'm about to get up and say it. But Umar, then uh, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr says, ala rislika, which a classical way means, relax, sit down. Sit down. So then Umar, mashallah. So you can already see now, you can already see it in each of skills, leaders coming out now. And Umar says, Abu Bakr spoke, and it's better than my speech. Obviously, in Umar's speech, we're going to find out what he was going to say. So, Abu Bakr spoke better than me. And by Allah, there was nothing that I had prepared and that I liked, okay, except that Abu Bakr mentioned it. It only that everything I wanted to say, Abu Bakr said it, I'm better. So, all this time has come down. The Ansar, the Ansar, the Ansar, the Ansar, the Ansar, because obviously the household of the Prophet and the rest are praying the Prophet and the Muslim, they bury them, they take care of them. So they, they are not there at this very important time. But here and now the Ansar are saying, look, um, leadership talk, you know, we think that we are more deserving of leadership. And Abu Bakr and the Muhajir know the hadith that the leaders are from the Muhajir. Yes? But is, it, is that an issue or not an issue? It's an issue. Why is it an issue? We pay attention. Why is it an issue to hear it? Because the Ansar are, they want to elect someone amongst them despite knowing this hadith from yeah. the Quraysh. Well, maybe they didn't know well, The point is that Abu Bakr and his Abba knew the prophet specified the leader would be from, from this tribe, Quraysh, yeah? uh, big tribe of 
We have now the issue now is that Umar and Abu Bakr and other Sahaba say, Umar, if you let this go ahead, this is not how the Prophet wanted it. This is not how the Prophet wanted it. Either we remain silent and go with it, and then we disobey the Prophet already. Or, yeah, I mean, or we, uh, we go along with it, hating it, and that's a problem. Because we can't agree with it, we can't go ahead and leave it out this we don't disagree with. Or we go or, or we go to fight with them. The way of us how do we then? Can you imagine all this is going on right now? At the same time, the prophet is dead to us there. Get that emotion that people but look at Abu Bakr. Hopefully that you know clarify this particular whole context. Abu Bakr says, he gets up, Abu Bakr says, Siyah Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. What are these? They're all brothers, they're all together. These are all Sahaba, these people who lived, died, they, 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 they must marry, they must family with each other, they, they fought against you know, good and good times and bad times. These people with each other all the time. Abu Bakr said, What you have said, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, is correct. In regards to your tribes and to yourselves. And no one knows this better than Quraysh. Like, yeah, you, you understand what you guys did for us. Yeah, we appreciate the other. And your merits will remain for the end of time. People will sing your praises for the Quran, and rightly so. They took in the prophet and the, the, the Sahara from Mecca. Nobody else did. And to this day, Medina is called Medina. Alright? And he said, your rank and your position is preserved forever. Not to have any chamber. So he's praised them, he's endorsed them, but then he says, however, the Prophet specifically mentioned that this affair, leadership is from Quraysh. And they are the, the most middle also and of the Arabs in lineage. And the Prophet says, well, okay, Amazing, or brackets, and I've picked two from them, and I've picked the truth. What was that? What was that? Amazing, right? You just ponder on that. What could have gone wrong? Uh, had the wrong thing been said, or had it been said in the wrong way? You say, no, you guys, you know, you know, the side, you took us in. Yeah, and it's great, and he gave us this, it is what it is. But then he said, I'm the prophet. He said that this leadership comes from and then he said, look, I'll bring two. And you can you, you speak between yourself or pick. He didn't, didn't say himself. He did not say himself. Say so, <laughs> so obviously he's picked two people. So now Omar, that's 20 years later. Omar saying, oh all of a sudden my hand is being pushed forward. Uh, he said, Whoa. Me and uh, Ibn, Ibn Ubaidullah bin Jarrah, he was also of the two. And I remember now this hadith says, in this narration, Baba says, everything Abu Bakr said was like, was excellent. And the only thing I hated was last part, he's pushing me forward. You know, it's me, like, that's not, that was my agenda. <laughs> you know, that's not why, that's not why I wanted it. You know, in my account of the bucket, here's the bucket. Pushing me forward. Uh, and by the way, uh, Ibn Rabaydullah bin Jarrah, just so you do not, do not think you can find this, the Prophet referred to him as Amin of the Sunnah. Amin. Who knows what Amin means? Amin. In Arabic. Shaks Amin. Trustworthy. Just to let you know who that particular companion is. Because you, may, you, you could argue that he'd been overshadowed by these great Sahara leaders, somebody who had the most uh, an enemy of the woman, a trustworthy or the trustworthy person of this woman. <coughs> but it was stupid. So I uh, said there was nothing I despite from what you said. I, I say in this last part. I would have preferred so this is not around. This is not around. This is this is important, right? These things must have been more going forward. Rabbi said, I would have preferred that my neck was cut, my head was chopped off, rather than being put in this position of leadership in the presence of Abu Bakr. Rabbi did not want it. Abu Bakr did not want it. They're pushing each other forward. So, now that Hassan, at this point, begins to get the idea. 
but there was still some interest amongst them in not making so much amongst themselves. Obviously, yeah, I they were convinced, but this is my idea. Listen carefully. The Sahaba are human. You say, say it again. The Sahaba are human. The human beings. They are not masoon and fallible. In other words, they can make mistakes. Human. Their mistakes are greater than our, are, are lesser than our mistakes. They, they make less mistakes than us. We make more mistakes than them. They have a higher rank. And they, have, they reach the higher level of perfection. Right? But they're still human beings. They are, this is not speaking for them. Again, they are still human beings. <coughs> so, so Umar, mashallah, then said, okay, that uh, he, one of the cases that I like, or what I should be the leader, basically, no more, you know, he's the best leader. And he said, I need that one, I'm very sure, right? One, one step further. I give my allegiance to Umar. <laughs> so, the Bible is the Bible. The Bible is the Bible. I'm not going to say, no, you, no, you, no, you. You are not the first one to pay the least. But in other words, he said, it's all wrong. Now you got that. The Bible is obviously not going to have that plan with him. But Allah, mashallah, he had that plan. Allah, the great, the greater, the greatest of plans. And the whole big bayah, four of them, the Ansar and the Muhammad, they all gave bayah, those who were there, they all gave bayah, they all gave bayah, they, they realized that Abu Bakr is the greatest son, and Musa, the prophet, who he died, and, and nominated Abu Bakr to, to be the Imam while he was sick. That's one of the proofs that the Ahmed and the Jirai used for, um, for Abu Bakr. You know, his, his, uh, Right of the head of the head. But he himself did not like Okay? And this happened, mashallah, they, they took that they are here all day, the leaders. Except for Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, okay, he didn't give us the pledge of allegiance. The human beings, the human beings. Okay? Now, Umar explains that he, and no, this is done very, very quickly. It's a very bush, it's like a bush job. If they think some of the greatest, greatest Sahara were there, Sayyid Ali wasn't there, but the Sahara were there. But the way it was going down necessitated that this happened like this. That's what Umar, actually, Umar said years later, okay, when uh, uh, towards the end of this Khalafa, okay, he actually referred that this was done in a very early <coughs> state. Because what was, what was on stake here was, on stake here was that Ali was being appointed to the Prophet. Allah did not indicate that that person from that particular trial. That was a big disaster. And that that happened to the Prophet. So, but in the idea, it was hurry, it was rush. And what we take from that, the take home from that is that nobody was specified by the Prophet to be the Khalifa. That's the take home message that I want you to take home. Right. We are. Misha has come in. Inshallah. Uh, where's Amir? Uh, you can go to the Adan, please. You can tell him which way the Qibla is.
statement of a sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has passed away. Something that had never been done before. Right? This has never been done before. So the Muslims overcame this disaster in the short term by electing the Prophet's companion Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him to provide political and judicial leadership. So the story goes that Umar the Khattab, many years later, he talked about what actually happened. And what happens is that he is aware that the Sahaba, in particular the Ansar, who are the Ansar? Who are the Ansar? The helpers. The helpers. Who are the helpers? From? Mecca. From? From? <coughs> and so the Ansar were already now discussing who to elect from within themselves to be the possible leader. At that particular time, that well, as that was going on, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a blessed body sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is being prepared to be uh, buried. So the Ahl Bayt, the Ahl Bayt, were not present. This was happening because they're seeing to the needs of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in terms of approval. Umar hears about this, and he then tells Abu Bakr and some others. Let us go and participate in this. Because what they know is that the Prophet ﷺ said what? That leadership is from the Quraysh. And the Quraysh are from which? which? From the Ansar or the Mahayun? The Mahayun. So the Prophet so he said to them, the only description, the only kind of guidance in terms of where, who the leader he should be, is that it's from Quraysh? It's a hadith. Al A'inna bin Quraysh. And the Ansar are not from Quraysh. So that puts them in a dilemma. So Umar then realized we better go step in because if we don't, we can't go ahead with that because then we are disobeying the Prophet. So they go. Obviously, Abu Bakr, after Umar bin Khattab, has a plan in his head. Alright? He has a big speech ready. To nominate who? To nominate Abu Bakr. That's the whole idea. I don't know what they're doing. And they go. And they go and they find that the Ansar are in the middle of kind of electing somebody. And just not the way she'd be going down. At which point, they, they welcome in Abu Bakr and the rest. And Abu Bakr does something very interesting. I don't know if you caught it from what I was saying though, but Abu Bakr praises them. He praises them and mentions their merits and mentions how great they are. And, and he gives credit where credit is due. Right? And said that they have a merit for the end of time. Because they were they were called the Ansar. They helped. Nobody else has that. Uh, uh, merit and the prophet praise them. So Abu Bakr is enforcing that and giving them the credit. Those of you who are in, ever in a position of authority, learn from this situation. Praise people where praise is due. However, Abu Bakr is a man of God. And he says, however, when it comes to leadership, Abdul Wasif, over here, this is more important than anything else going on behind you. The leadership is from Quraysh. So now he's kind of like, okay, he's praised them, but now he's taking a stance because this is the Allah. Nothing personal. Had the Prophet said otherwise, Abu Bakr would be endorsing that, but he didn't. So Abu Bakr then says, uh, uh, reminding them what the Prophet said, 
He then says, and I have two nominations for you. And one of them is from the Khattab, whose hand now gets pushed forward, and another from the, from the Sahaba, uh, Jarrah, Ibn, Ab, Ibn, Ab, Ibn Abdullah ibn Jarrah, he gets pushed forward as well. Neither of them know that they're being nominated, nominated by Abu Bakr. Umar al Khattab, obviously that's not his plan, is it? Umar al Khattab is thinking, oh, that's not what I had in mind. My plan was to say a speech, and he was about to say a speech. Abu Bakr told him to sit down. Interesting. And the interesting what? Abu Bakr sat down. And that's why I said in, in, in my previous lecture, you can see the leadership already there. But look at Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr didn't say, I'm going to be a leader. He didn't say that. He said, and I'll give me two people. He takes Umar ibn Khattab and Abdullah ibn Jarrah and these two. Pick whichever one of these two you want. Amazing skill. All right? He, he is telling look after these two, pick which one you want out of these two. He's giving them a choice. And then in modern kind of, uh, in terms of parenting skills, there's a special technique for this, so I don't know what it's called, but it's great. And you're kind of empowering them, you know, you can't tell them what to do, but empowering them as well at the same time. They get them to do what you want to do. Now, Umar al Khattab, alright, again, that's not his plan. Uh, that's not his plan. And he says, and this is many years later, he's been telling you about the story many years later, he says, uh, I loved everything that Abu Bakr said. He praised al Salah, he reminded them of, of, of the hadith, and kind of, kind of basically uh, uh, calmed everything down. Except for one thing I didn't like when he nominated me. And Umar al Khattab, he says, I disliked from what he said. I did not dislike anything from what he said except for this last part, i.e., where he pushed him. I would have preferred that my neck is cut rather than take this position in a presence of, of, of Abu Bakr. That's what he said. And so Abu Bakr now realized, okay, no, no, I, I shouldn't be the Khalifa. So what he does, and again, this is going to be he's in a few steps ahead, he then says, he tells everybody, listen, Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa, and I'm going to give him the bay'ah. I pledge allegiance to him. This is where he's setting an example. I'm giving allegiance to him already. Uh, see you later. Uh, see, uh, Abu Bakr didn't do that, right? Oh, no, mashallah. I'm kind of thinking ahead. Very astute. He goes, he should be the leader, and I'm the first one to give him the bay'ah. I, I, I give him the, the oath of allegiance. Okay. And no one's going to say no, they'll follow. Apart from one uh, who kind of didn't want to for whatever reason, I could have a good opinion. That's how Abu Bakr became the Khalifa. I've come to the Sunni uh, tradition. Again, other traditions, other interpretations may have a different perspective, but we are not concerned with that. We're concerned with the Sunni tradition. Right? A hundred more things could have gone wrong there, but they didn't. And again, as we said before, Allah is going to preserve his being. That was a critical moment in our history. It was dealt with, alhamdulillah. Many lessons there to be learned. But yeah, so, Hassan, back to you. The Muslims overcame this in the short term by electing the Prophet's companion Abu Bakr to provide political and judicial leadership. He had no direct divine inspiration and was not receiving re revelations. Why? Why? Because he's not a prophet. He's not a prophet. Okay? And that's how. Sunni Islam holds that he initially didn't want it, but the Sahaba nominated him. Eventually, all the Sahaba gave him the oath of allegiance, Bayar. Including the Prophet's family later on. They did. So, Ibn Ali and Ahl Bayt stayed the Bayar to the lake. Not them. Because they were there. They were um, busy getting the ready. I'm not seeing warning and so on and so forth. Thus, stabilizing the Ummah. Abu Bakr, 11 to 13 AH. So I'm going to give you the Khulafa and how long they uh, reigned. How many years? Two. Two. Umar, 
13 to 23 AH. Other years? Mine, 23 to 35 AH. Ali? 12. Ali, 35 to 40 AH. Hassan, six months. Not you, uh, the, the council of the project. So, the Hassan, uh, he took you had it for six months before you gave it over to uh, Mahalia. That's important. That is important. The caliphate is 30 years, <laughs> then it will be kingship. Because the Prophet actually foretold, prophesied <coughs> the length of the Khilafah. 30 years. In a hadith made by Ahmed Abu Dawood, Imam Tirmidhi, and the same, to which Imam Nasiyuti says, None were in the 30 years after the death of the Messenger وسلم, except the four caliphs and the days of Hassan. So the Prophet in this hadith, the Khilaf will be 30 years, then it will be kingship, kingship, mulk. Hassan completes the 30 years. So Ibn Hassan completes 30 years by his, his term in, uh, in, in office, if you want to call it that, uh, in six, for those six months. 30 years altogether. And then started the Umayyad dynasty, right? No. So, we are now going to talk about the merit of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Bismillah. Hold on. Real name, Abdullah bin Abi Qahafa. Qahafa. Ah, how many of you knew that? Abu Bakr's name? <coughs> That's his real name. <coughs> Abdullah <coughs> bin Abi Qahafa. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, the truthful one, <coughs> due to his belief in the Messenger وسلم, at every junction, never wavering, met the Messenger وسلم, when he was young on the journey to Sham. Yes, people don't know that, that Abu Bakr was <coughs> with the Prophet as a young, a young man. When the Prophet went to Sham in a very early journey, that you on the same caravan with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the books of Sirah. Freeing of slaves who were Muslim, including Bilal. Examples such as the Isra wal Miraj, their night journey. <coughs> Why did I put that there? An Isra wal Miraj, which uh, is a 27th night of Rajab, which falls on, on this Friday. This Friday night is a, is a 27th night of Rajab, which the vast majority of the historians say that's the night of the Isra al Mi'raj. I mention that there is because Abu Bakr's name, uh, the truthful one, he got that term because of his response to the Kuffar. When the Kuffar said, came to Abu Bakr and said, Listen, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has claimed that he'd gone to the land. <coughs> of Mr. Al-Aqsa and pray there and go to the heavens and come back all in one night a journey that takes many many weeks what do you say now oh Abu Bakr and he said if that's what he said then it's true which is a very clever response why is it clever if that's what he said why is he clever? Why is that kind of response? Again, you know, we are we're starved of his lessons. Look, man. That was his iman right there. Yeah, but what, what, what's clever about his response? His, his response is clever. Maryam. Is that the Quran just immediately after the Prophet Muhammad that it's not one of the original Not the answer, you're right, but not the answer I'm looking for. Zahir. Is that if that's what he said, bit? And it's like, you could be making up lies. Hey, you are. They could be lying, right? <laughs> they could be both like, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, you know, he said this, this, and this. You know, what you say? And he, they, he goes, oh yeah, I believe it. He goes, ah, you were lying. You were joking. <coughs> yeah, that happened. He could be like joking around. So he said, if that's what you said, then I believe it. Very clever response. If that's what he said, I believe it. And that's how he was given the term, eh? the truth of Allah. May Allah be pleased with him. Continuing on. Leaving his family to emigrate with the Messenger of Allah. You know that, right? The Prophet uh, said, Abu Bakr <coughs> left his family to travel with the Prophet alone 
and staying in the cave for three nights. We know that, and they travel to Medina with him. Left his family behind. Okay, the sacrifice he made. Staying in the cave and the verses of the Quran. His speech in Badr, Hunayn. <coughs> Same the speech in Badr and Hunayn. Again, go back to the books of Sirah. We don't have time for that, to go into that, sadly. But very, very big lessons there to, uh, to be gained. His piety and wisdom. His speech when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. And we know that when the Prophet passed away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said the Umar, he was very emotional. All right, and he said, if anybody, he took his sword out and said, if anybody said the Prophet is, is, is dead, I'll chop his head off. So Mubakir then comes up, again, another sign of his, of his, of his worth, okay, that he should be the Khalifa. Uh, again, standing up and, you know, these critical moments in, in, in our early history, saying that, look, you know, he mentioned the verse of the Quran, whoever worships the Prophet, not that he is dead, but worship Allah, and what Allah is not dead. And Allah said, that verse is as if the first time I'd ever heard it. Obviously, it wasn't the first time he'd ever heard it. He'd heard it many times before, but it kind of dropped, it kind of penny dropped in. You know, when he it. Again, these are all the great merits of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Moving on to Sayyidina Abu Bakr ibn Khattab, Bismillah. The great companion of Islam that the Messenger وسلم, made dua for him to become Muslim. The Prophet made dua for Sayyidina Abu Bakr ibn Khattab, and one of the, one of the persons that Sayyidina Abu Bakr made dua to become Muslim. Other people that the Prophet made dua for was Khalid ibn Walid. Who is Khalid ibn Walid? Sayyidullah ibn Sayyidullah. The sword that was the sword of Allah. Understand the context. The Prophet is making dua for an, an opponent of his who is responsible for the killing of Muslims, because he's, he's a military leader on the other side, fighting against the Muslims. The Prophet is making dua for Allah making Muslim. What does that say to us in this age of how we deal with those people in oppose, uh, who oppose uh, the Ummah of the Prophet? What does that sign in the human dua for the a'da or adu uh, of Islam? Again, that's a sunnah that we don't really think about. It's very profound, is it not? Is Islam strengthening Islam? Made his migration public when many did so secretly. The Messenger وسلم, referred to him as if there was going to be a prophet after him, it would be him. That in itself, that was the only thing, subhanAllah. The Prophet said, if there was going to be a prophet after me, it would be Sayyidina The Shaytan flees from you, O Umar. Three, four of his ideas suggested to the Messenger وسلم, were endorsed by Allah by a revelation in the Quran. Three or four of Abu al Khattab's actual uh, um, um, suggestions were endorsed by Allah in the Quran. Revelation came down saying that the position of Sayyidina Abu al Khattab on this matter is in, in alignment with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Several verses here. The father in law of the Messenger وسلم, Meaning what? The, uh, the Prophet married his daughter. Um, okay. I'm, I'm the I One of the greatest scholars of Islam. His idea to establish the Tarawi prayer as the 20 Rakat, the writing of the Mus'haf. Well, the bid'ah of 20 Rakat. <laughs> okay, Tarawih. Okay, and the writing of the, the, the suggestion to Abu Bakr of writing the Mus'haf, compiling the Mus'haf at the time when. Um, the Qurra, the Hufa, the Qurra, 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 the Many countries became Muslim during his time. The land, the, ba um, the boundaries of Islam, or the lands of, um, uh, increased massively during his career. Uh, the borders. Masjid al-Aqsa and the Jerusalem became under Muslim rule. rule. Okay. Established a pension system. Mm. One of the um, many universities strike all the time, you know, so yeah, it strikes the union striking because the pension system. Uh, I remember the Khattab, I remember that. <laughs> That's true. Before that, I, I, 
I'm not aware of another system beforehand for what I know. Could be wrong, but I'm not aware. Oh, you remember to say that for now. Married one of the messengers' daughter, When she died, the messenger وسلم, married him to his second daughter. Say that for men, they're the only companions that have married two of the Prophet's daughters. Bil Nurain, the one who has the two lights, the name, the nickname. Which tells you something about Sayyidina Uthman's uh, position in the eyes of the Prophet. If the Prophet is going to marry two of his daughters to him, yeah, one passed away and married next, obviously with their permission, obviously. It tells you something, right? What the Prophet thinks of him. The only one to marry two. Only one to marry two of the Messenger's daughters, right? Alright? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just now, because I thought you did it twice. Mm -hmm. uh, I said it once and it's twice. Keep going. Should I not be shy from a man that the angels feel shy from? That's what the Prophet said about him. Should I not feel shy from a man? Who is that man? The God's man. Are the angels feel shy from? And he can say anything. No harm, Dara. Will come to Uthman after what he has done today. The Messenger وسلم, promised the one who, who prepared the army of Usra and dug the well of Huma, paradise. Uthman was the one who did this. <laughs> the Messenger وسلم, said, He on that day is on guidance. So the great thing to say to Uthman about an event that happens at a particular point in time. Prophet وسلم, said that this oppressed one will be killed when prophesizing what was to come of the fitna. Pause there. So that's going to lead us up to uh, next week's lecture. The Prophet said this oppressed one went into hell. Uthman. 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 Uthman will be killed. <coughs> the Prophet is saying that he will be killed. He is oppressed. Okay? When prophesizing what was to come of the fitna. That's important. That's a clue for next week's class of the after. How do you think Uthman is the closest one to me in character for my companions. MashaAllah. What an endorsement. What an endorsement. How do you finish? The merit of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the doctor of Allah here. As much as he written on him. One of the ten promised paradise by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one whom the Messenger وسلم, took as a brother. The Prophet took him as a brother, and presented him as a brother. The Messenger وسلم, is his father in law as he married his daughter Fatima to him. The grandchildren of the Messenger وسلم, Hassan and Hussein, the children of Ali and Fatima, is where the prophetic bloodline comes. The, the Ahl Bayt, the noble family of our Prophet, وسلم, from whom great scholars of our history have come from. East and West, that bloodline comes from Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Fatima and Zahra, their marriage. Yeah? The, 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 the bloodline of the Prophet is preserved uh, primarily through uh, Sayyidina Ali and Fatima and Zahra, through Sayyidina Hassan, Hassan and Hussain. Referred to as Ahlul Bayt, the family of the household. <laughs> One of the early converts to Islam as a young man of 10 years. Some say that he was the first. 10 years old, imagine that. Yeah. MashaAllah. In front of all these other people, um, the difficulty at that time. A young man, 10 years, he took shahada. With the Prophet Never worship idols prior to his shahada. So he's from the young, the youngsters, if I call that. Uh, he never, before his. Uh, Shahada, he never worshipped anything else, uh, any idols. Obviously, some of the oldest Sahaba did, and uh, believe that. A good example of Sayyidina Umar al Khattab. Sayyidina Umar al Khattab, uh, in reflecting on previous years, he was saying that they used to have, uh, he used to worship this uh, deity made of dates, he said. He said, he used to say, my mind was alert at the time because when I get hungry, I have nothing to eat. I look at this idol that I'm worshipping and start eating from it. 
<laughs> in many years they've been laughing at that kind of stuff. Where was the mind at that time? The point that Sayyidina Ali never did that. Ali was the one whom the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entrusted to deal with his affairs when he migrated to Medina. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left his affairs when he left Mecca and went to Medina. He left his affairs all to Sayyidina Ali. Who Sayyidina Ali slept in the bed of the Prophet when, all, uh, when the, um, the people who were conspiring to kill the Prophet were outside his house. Who slept in the bed? Sayyidina Ali. And the Prophet told him, sleep, sleep there. SubhanAllah. And then Sayyidina Ali takes that. Uh, and the fact that the Prophet left all his affair to Sayyidina Ali uh, to distribute the things that were left behind. Uh, tell you something about Sayyidina Ali's position in the eyes of the Prophet. He was present in all the battles except for Tubuk, where the Messenger وسلم, left in charge of Medina. The one whom the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave the flag to at the Battle of Khaybar. I did the khutbah on that about last semester. Are you not satisfied that you are like me to Harun with the Musa except that there is no Prophet after me? He no, Khali, the Prophet said to Sayyidina Ali, are you not satisfied that you, Sayyidina Ali, are to me like Harun with the Musa? You know the famous uh, story of Musa? Allah wanted, uh, Sayyidina Musa wanted after Allah to, to so by his side, he put Sayyidina Harun by his side. What the Prophet is saying is that you, Sayyidina Ali, to me, are like Harun was the Musa. MashaAllah. You got it? He loves Allah and His Messenger, and Allah and His Messenger loves him. Well, that's an endorsement by itself. Start that You got it. One of the greatest spiritual <laughs> scholars of the Sahaba, one of the most courageous Sahaba on the battlefield, and and of it. One of the best speakers and famous for his zuhud, taking little from this world, one of a few who collected the Quran and showed it to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alright, we don't all have to kind of get us in the right frame of mind. The Caliphates or the Khilafah are called the Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah in terms of conditions. Conditions of the Caliph. It is wajib to appoint a leader over the Muslims. The Muslims cannot have a leaderless uh, um, state. There has to be someone in charge. Well, it's <laughs> wajib. Yeah? It's obligatory to have a leader. The majority of scholars say that it must be from the tribe of the Quraysh, as the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specifically indicate this. The Imams are from Quraysh. The majority is some, a minority of scholars say for the ones, but the majority say that. That the appointment needs to be made by what it's what's called Ahlul Hilli wal Aqad. Ahlul Hilli wal Aqad, a term referring to the wisest of people who hold positions of knowledge, piety, <coughs> and leadership amongst people. <coughs> so this, um, putting a person in leadership of Muslims, it's not left to every single person to kind of vote. Alright? It's left to a group of people have, uh, who are knowledgeable, understand, have the best interests of society, they come. And they elect somebody from amongst themselves. That's how it works. Alright? On the condition that they are wise and knowledgeable and pious. Alright? Can anybody else see something similar to this in other faces? Yeah. Oh, Chris. Uh, yeah, the Pope. Okay. What they do? The Cardinals. They all they get this room, yeah. all right, and they kind of, between themselves, they kind of nominate, because they're, the, they're, they're the wisest and have the best, have the most knowledge. So but from the rooms themselves, they nominate, and they have the chili at the end with a particular, particular, if you see that, bam, bam, we'll give you know what I'm talking about. I don't know if that happens. Uh, but we have something similar. Please note that this, this idea that everybody votes for somebody, that's not kind of a, a, a that's not how it's done. Although in the modern world, you know, kind of left to that as an alternative. They act as consultation and must have their best interests of the Muslims. 
They discuss the matter between themselves and they seek opinion from the wider Muslims who have knowledge and expertise. Yes, they discuss the matter between themselves and they may seek opinion from the wider Muslims who have knowledge and expertise. That's similar to you may take some ideas, some kind of democratic ideas, uh, um, uh, inform that in some way. Whomever they nominate is a caliph, and then they give bayah allegiance to him. The leader must therefore be Qurayshi, upright religiously, nominated by consultation, and then given bayah to. Why is knowing this useful? How does this help us answer the question, what forces, sh what forces shape our understanding of Islam in the contemporary world? So, let me think about that for a second. Let me finish, inshallah. Last, last two slides. What do you think about this? Why is knowing this useful? And how does this help? What was the original question? What forces shape our understanding of Islam in the contemporary world? What does that have to do with how we understand Islam today? Forces shaping our understanding of Islam in the contemporary world. It will help us greatly to understand our modern, increasingly divided, chaotic situation if we look closely at those forces which divide us, divided us in the distant past. Why? Anybody wanna? Go ahead. Because history repeats itself. Yes. History repeats itself. In ways that will become surprisingly and abundantly clear in the next few weeks. Because they are still dividing forces today, shaping and influencing, influencing our contemporary understanding of Islam today for many. Religions enjoy an initial period of unity and then descend into an increasingly bitter factionalism led by rival hierarchies. Christianity has furnished the most obvious example of this. You one could add many others, including secular faiths such as Marxism. On the face of it, Islam's ability to avoid its fate is astonishing and demands careful analysis. See, understanding the four methods. I recommend you read the article. Understanding the four methods by Abdul Hakim Murad. Excellent. Anybody in the spectrum or has not read that, please go and read that. But we will still need to explain some painful exceptions to the rule in the earliest phase of our history. We will need to explain some painful exceptions. Exceptions to what? To the unity that happened. Not all unified. Huh? A lot of things happened that we're going to look at in enough detail to give you the point that we're trying to get across. The Prophet ﷺ himself had told his companions in a hadith narrated by Imam Tirmidhi that whoever among you outlives me shall see a vast dispute. The Prophet is saying, Allah Muslim, whoever amongst you outlives me, sallallahu alayhi wa will see what? A vast dispute, dispute, fitting. <coughs> and he's referring to something very specific amongst the Sahara. He's saying, things will happen. Again, see and understand the four methods by Abdul Hakim Murad. Excellent article. You need to go back and look at that. But the question is this if the Prophet said that, whoever amongst you lives me shall see a vast dispute. And he's talking about the Sahara. The question is what? What were the disputes? What were these disputes? And that's where next week's class, not next week, the week after. There's no class next week, right. sadly, inshallah. But the week after, inshallah, should Allah will, for us to return, we will return. And we're going to look at those disputes and start to look at um, what happened. Because a great fitna, tribulation, began to happen around, around the time of the, of the Khulafa, 
and certain <coughs> movements and understandings and approaches that began then. And those same approaches and understandings, all right, are contributing to how you think now. To this day, in ways you have yet to even comprehend. But you will comprehend for those who Allah gives comprehension to. Okay, inshallah. I will end there. This is the sisters who need to leave or would like to ask you a question. Can I ask you to raise your hands if you have any questions? Ladies first. On this topic. None. All right, back to our brothers in Islam. On the slide about Uthman, uh, the hadith you quoted. I've sent you this uh, on your email. You're checking it out. Okay. <clears throat> Can you send last week's and this week's in PDF to Zahir? You guys sort out. I don't know why it's come up on my email as a permission first. Can you sort send it to him? Uh, the hadith was no harm shall be done um, to this uh, because of this day what was this day referring to and he also said no harm on this uh, but then also he said no harm but then he was harmed so what does what was he referring to when he said harm a lot of nonsense to have a lot of specific things. But, you know, the, uh, he's a sheikh. That's the Haram. That's the Haram. Sir, in one of the slides you wrote uh, that in uh, the Ahl-Sunnah uh, and there is no explicit evidence that the Prophet appointed someone. My name? Yeah, yes, appointed mm -hmm. someone. Else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but for example, if you look at Sahih Muslim, there is hadith to Khaybar which shows which kind of alludes to the fact that maybe Ali ibn Abi Talib could have been the uh, the Khalif who should have been appointed first. Uh, there is also two hadiths which are in, in uh, uh, Bukhari. They're basically the same hadith but different narrations. One that says Tamasuku bi Thaqalain, Kitabullah wa Sunnati. And then there's another one with another narration, Kitabullah wa Atrata Ahla Bayti. And both of those narrations are in uh, Bukhari. And also in Hujat al Wada, even though he doesn't, again, as you said, he didn't mention it explicitly, but there's kind of like an allusion again to uh, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Yeah. So. Uh, there, there, there is a, um, there is that allusion, yes. Uh, there is an um, indication for that. But the stronger, greater, clearer indication <coughs> uh, would be towards Sayyidina Abu Bakr and the endorsement. Of Abu Bakr's Khilafah uh, uh, certifies that position. Because if they said Ali, uh, uh, yes, he did eventually, yes. Yes, yes. yes, he did mm -hmm. eventually with the bay'ah with him. But also, for example, if you look at uh, Abu Bakr's Khilafah, Umar's Khilafah, Uthman's Khilafah, they all had consultants and they chose Ali bin Abi Talib as their consultant. So doesn't that, doesn't that show that maybe. Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be sectarian here, I'm yeah, not trying no, to be no, sectarian, no. but. <laughs> And that's why uh, um, some have, have kind of... Uh, um, like I revere Umar and uh, Abu Bakr. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, So yeah, um, all, all, all four have their merits. And that's why I put the merits. I spent all that time going into the merits. All four have the merit. But um, the clearest and in terms of, uh, and you can argue that Sayyidina Umar should have been the Khalifa because the Prophet isn't any Prophet after me, if he said Umar. Mm -hmm. that. But the Sahaba, and in terms of their um, endorsement, mm -hmm. they're all unanimously endorsing Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Mm -hmm. And that endorsement there is kind of, uh, it's kind of proof. Mm -hmm. 
بعدين ما تبدا بعدين ما تبدا تشوز علي بن ابي طالب از كونسلتنت لايك ابو بكر اند عمر بن الخطاب دي هاد كونسلتنت دي تشوز علي هو اللي تشوز علي بن ابي طالب هو هو من هو سيد علي ما شاء الله يعني هو من هو اوف كورس هو Two things. The first thing is that in, when Prophet Sallallahu said that the Ummah when I agree on manifest error, could you argue that's a proof for yeah. the fact that they agree? Yeah. yeah. And uh, another thing is that while uh, Abu Bakr was chosen, um, the Ahlul Bayt was so obviously grieving on Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. So. And also, sorry, I forgot to mention that it's still recording. Uh, uh, it's very important, and uh, I don't know if you picked it up in the recording. What Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab he says. In many, many years later, that it was very rushed. That the fact that um, the Ahl al Bayt went there, yeah, it, it, they would have preferred it didn't go down the way it went down. They would have preferred more people to be accepted to Ahl al Bayt and Ali to be there as well. But because, and the Sayyidina Umar the first thought as an Ayatelta, in the tradition, it was an Ayatelta. And he, he said it was rushed. But the reason, you know, why, why, why did he wish it? Because what was happening at the time? The Ansar were trying to do what? With good intentions. What, what, what were they doing at the time in Sahiba? What were they doing? Picking their own. They tried to hang up. So Umar came back, let's see, like, okay, we've got to move quickly because they didn't end up picking somebody who we can't shoot, can't follow. Because the Prophet already said, the leaders from Quraysh. So I'm not taking 10 steps down the line. If they go ahead and do this and come out, then we're going to have to go against them. Maybe take our swords out. We don't want that. So it was good. And, you know, said, no, I'm not saying it. We wish it. It wasn't an issue. You know, they would prefer it. They, didn't, they took a bit more time. But they had to wish it because of the situation. Allah decrees whatever he wants. And he's the, the right man for the job. And the Sunnah of Jama'ah and the Lita Sunnah of Abu Bakr, he was the right man for the job. And this is Allah that tells you that. So, what was the reaction of the Ahlul Bayt when they found out that the decision was made? We'll come to that next week. Probably after that. I have another question that you know, the Imam. Any of my sisters? You know, the Imams that come from the Ahlul Bayt, right? We'll talk about that. I don't know if I'm going to come from the Ahlul Bayt. I was just, for example, the Imam of Bakir and the Salim. Are they Imams of Ahlul Sunnah as well? Yes, in the understanding of Ahlul Sunnah, and we'll talk about that week after, week after the next class, after the next class. We'll go into that as well. So I have two questions. The first one is short and the second one is a bit... Uh, so the first question is Ansar. The reason they were called Ansar, is it from the word Nasara or... Ayo. Okay. Ayo. What's the word mean? What do you say? Allah, Allah, Allah. Huh? What is that? Huh? What is that? Huh? What is that? Huh? And then? Yeah. So I forgot that. Too. Yeah, yeah. But so isn't it? Uh, also, I heard wasn't one of the reasons why they were called Ansar is because they used to be Christian, like an Ansar from Nasara. When did they convert? Well, Allah, what I know is that Ansar they helped huh? Nasara help. Allah. Okay. And so I just want to ask you the second question. Oh. So remember last time we were talking about the um, the ultra traditionists for conservatives and the ultra liberals and how there's the ultra liberals that are trying to kind of modernize kind of some of the religious uh, the fetch ones. Okay, so the the main uh, claim that, that they make when they're trying to do this is Hold on, let me, uh, what do you mean by modernizing fetch ones? So for example, there are debates in the, around the Arab world around, for example, equality and inheritance. Uh, ah, for example, okay. deleting polygamy. For example. Um, so, for example, when they uh, talk about this, they, for example, bring the example of Umar bin al-Khattab, and there are two examples. For example, in, in one of his years as the Khalif, uh, there was a famine, and so he yeah, uh, yeah. punishing thieves by amputating their hands, that's one. And then the second one is, for example, uh, when he stopped giving a zakat to al-mu'allafati <coughs> qulubuhum. And even though, like in the Quran, it says, إِنَّمَ الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ so, uh, and Umar al Khattab stopped giving a zakat to al Mu'allafati Qulubuhum. And uh, nobody says that he did something which is against Islam when he did either of those things. We say that he did ishtihad. 
So why can't we today do the same thing that Omar al Khattab did in the past and you know work and use ishtihad to modernize our fatwa? Okay, <coughs> good question, very good question. Uh, I'm not, I haven't heard of the second one about the Al-Ma'ifat al Qulub where he stopped. I'm, I'm, that I'm not, I'm not knowledge of. The one before that, uh, when he suspended um, uh, the Qasas uh, I'm, I'm aware of that one. Uh, and that's because the conditions uh, that allowed for Qadayyad were not fulfilled. Now, people were and they were and they were, and they were, and they were um, they were stealing to eat. Mm -hmm. To survive. That's so not that's so that is the had punishment that is suspended because you can't punish people who are already being punished as they are that is starving. So it's that had punishment there only works uh, in situations where it's not any but some would argue that if you're being lenient with people who are starving, then anyone can come and steal and say that, oh, I stole because I was starving. Like, that's down to the, to the hacking. Oh, okay. To answer your question, uh, what, who are, 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 So that's the one we've talked about. We've talked about that. What are the conditions of mushkid? We spoke about that. Okay. And the different levels of mushkid, 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 the different kinds of mushkid. There are seven uh, ranks of mushkid. The top is a mushkid, mushkid, or a mushkid, mutlaq. There are four grams. Abu Hanifa, Abu Malik, Abu Shafi, Abu Ahmed, Abu Muhammad. Nobody has ever reached the level of those four imams to reach the level of ishtihad. You have a mushkid in the madhab, like some of the great scholars of the madhab were. You have the other levels of ishtihad. The point is, should a person reach the level of a mushkid, all the conditions of the ulama of the soul are laid out, then ahl of the is not good. But this day and age, you don't. That's why you have strange fatality. Next question. Father. Are there any living Ishtahs? Which is? Which one? After the seven, the seven. It's eight. And like today. And um, which level is Ishtahs are you talking about? The top level. Like, like the four Imams? Or just the word like. Is it the four Imams? No. No. I'll refer you back to the next one. I'll look at lecture three. Inshallah. Nobody has ever reached the level. No one has ever claimed, <coughs> listen to my words carefully, no one has ever claimed absolute ishtihad on the level of the four imams and had their claim substantiated and endorsed by the ulama. Because you can't just say, I'm a Muslim, and everyone's going to follow you. The ulama, you know, they will pull the picture, let's talk, let's test you, you see. And Imam Masyuti, the great Imam, Imam Masyuti uh, of Egypt, who has written every single topic you can think of Tafsir, Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, Arabic language. Oh my, the books he has written on, even Orientalists uh, and, and people who study Islam who are not Muslim uh, are amazed by Imam Masyuti's works. He claimed to be a Muslim, but when he was, when he was um, about to be tested, he took back the claim as a God. You see. Oh, I Allah. In terms of um, in theory, can anybody reach that? Yes. Practically speaking, the height is so busy, so high to reach that level uh, that nobody has had ever reached that level and had the scholars of his time, all of them, endorse it. Yes. So only the four hands. Uh, it's open to anybody who wish to try. Anything else? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the other, the other, uh, um, the other mushahids at the time <coughs> of the four imams. Are they on the same level? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, they didn't have the followers that the other four did. They were the mushahids. Uh, that, that was a time, mashallah. All the mushahids. But they, uh, their schools became extinct because they didn't have 
a lot of, uh, not a lot of followers, a follow to, to kind of uh, um, preserve it and pass it on and to analyze it. Before Imams had thousands upon thousands of skulls look up their schools. But they were all Jewish names. Or the Imams. He talks about, uh, and also the other um, recommended reading that I thought for lecture three and four from, from last week. It talks about these things and how these conditions are met, and so on and so forth. Uh, lecture three and lecture four, uh, with a particular focus on the recommended reading. What was that? Please do go to the Abdul Hakim Warad. Abdul Hakim Again, it's on a recommended reading. In uh, lecture three or four. Okay. I heard that um, some interpretations of the word salaf, the three generations of the first three hundred years, is that incorrect? Or is that not true? First three generations, um, yeah. well, it tends to be within the first three hundred years, you could argue. Yeah, but the first three generations, yeah, well, uh, what? Were any of your own teachers from the bloodline of um, yes. Ali and Fatima? Not the, yeah. well, my, the bulk of my teachers, the way I stood in the room from Ali Bates. So, the bulk. Um, Shaykh Yemen, Had Omar, Had Ali, Had Ali Jeffrey, Had Ali Bakr, Had Ali Shaki, Had Sami Shaki, Had Ali from the bloodline of the Prophet. In Yemen, there's quite, there's quite a lot of tribes in Yemen, north and south, uh, that is well known They're from the Prophet's family. Uh, they either call it uh, Sada, or in, Yemen, in south they call it um, Habarib, and in north they call it Sada, or Sayyid. Some parts of Africa call Sharif. Sharif. And uh, you guys in the subcontinent? Sharif. 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 Or Sharif. Or Sharif. I've heard Sharif as well. These are the titles that indicate. Uh, a person from the bloodline of the Prophet. And it has to be proven. Oh, somebody can't say, I'm from the bloodline of the Prophet. It has to be proven. It has to be a common tree. It's a science. The scholars in Yemen who were, who were uh, experts, they used to have like, books of family trees where they could trace if you claim to be from the Prophet's family, they'd have, um, have um, books that they don't know. The Da Vinci Code, have you seen that movie or read the book? Da Vinci. Anything pious now. Okay, for those who are so pious they haven't seen that movie or read the book. The whole thing, just a spoiler, spoiler on this, the whole thing of that movie is that the, the bloodline of Jesus continues through people. That was the big, oh, the big thing of that movie. For Muslims, the bloodline of our prophet, and he, there's people in Liverpool from the, from the light from the blood of the prophet, huh? see where he waits. Living in Liverpool, there'll be some, there'll be some of you guys in the crowd. Uh, the, the big thing about movie was an everyday occurrence for Muslims. You know, Ahlul Bayt are, are, are there's people at uni I've met. You know, Ahlul Bayt. Okay, if you're respected, you're a level respecter because the blood, the blood of the prophet flows through them. Doesn't mean that if they're wrong, they don't correct them. Of course, it's, it's, that's what traditional Sunni classical Islam teaches you. Contrary to what you've been taught today. Uh, you've, we've talked about ijazas and sunnads before. Um, if you have an ijazah, does it automatically put you in the sunnad? If you have an ijazah to teach something... And you got it from somebody who's in yeah, the sunnad. Would, yeah, yeah. So what's the difference between the two? You can have a sunnad, you take a knowledge from somebody, but that shaykh hasn't given permission to teach it. Mm. So you can have an ijazah, you can have a sunnad, but that, but the sheikh hasn't given you permission to go and teach it. You don't have, you don't have a jazz. You can sit with scholars day in day out. 
but they haven't endorsed it to become a teacher. You can't, but you haven't you have that endorsement to become a teacher. But you can't have an ijazah without a senate. You can't have an idea. You can come to uni. I've gone to the University of Jamal's or the University of Liverpool. Right. Excellent. You sat in all the classes. Well done. Where's your certificate? I am got one. Because you didn't sit the exam. Or you didn't pass. So you get no certificate. But you still went to university. So you've got no certificate. Same thing. Anything from our sisters over here? Lovely. Say again? Family and Hashmi. Ayo, Hashmi, ma'am. Family and Hashmi. Yeah, if it's, uh, yeah, and Hashmi. I, I, mean, I, uh, I was in Cardiff, there was a family uh, called Hashmi. Yeah, they're from the Cardiff family. Well known. Um, in Yemen, so it's a white. In Yemen, in Somalia, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Africa, it's a pack. The blue of the Prophet was amazing. The bloodline of the Prophet is not just found amongst Arabs, it's found amongst the you know, people in Africa. I've seen people from Indonesia and Indonesia, alright, who are from the Prophet's family. Mother or father? After the Prophet. You know, Arab. Not for that means anything. You know, but you know, part of the, the bloodline of our Prophet is pretty much in every culture. That tells you something that's not long slang. Uh, so you know how some of our like ahkam al fiqhiyah they're built on ijma' right? And so basically a long time ago a group of fuqaha they did an ijma' a consensus on a certain to come up with a certain uh, edict. So is there anything that stops us from creating a new ijma' today in the modern yeah. world? Nothing. So we can create a new ijma' and uh, update kind of what they. Oh. Okay. And there is one last question. Well, no. Let me, let me change that. Well, okay. that's, my, that's my official answer. All of those best. Well, so, yeah. I guess my last question, sir, is uh, uh, so Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, like this name, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, like some, some people from other sects might feel like this name, um, it's like uh, people who follow from the four madahib, they're the only ones who, can, who are entitled to call themselves Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And in their view, it's like, we are, we are also following the sunnah of uh, Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam and we also have ijma' when it comes to driving al-ahkam al-fiqhiyya so why do they get to call themselves ahl sunnah wa jama'ah and not others? I think a better question that should be asked why whoever they are, why are they conforming to the definition of ahl sunnah wa jama'ah as been, has been agreed upon by Prophet Zubayas that's the real question I'll say, I'll say it again. Nothing, not for you to answer. It's a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. Those who have a problem with that definition, <coughs> the question should be put to them. Why are they following that, de that definition? That definition has been agreed upon oh. by the vast majority. Some people may disagree. Yes, there are people who disagree. But the majority, that definition, the, the definition, the standard in any Shah or fifth book, right? When that question has been asked, who was Ahl al Sunnah al Jama'ah? Ibn Hajj al Haythani. There's the authority figure in the Shafi'i school. For those who know anything about Shafi'i fiqh, when the Ibn Hajj al Haythami is, is an authority in the, in the Shafi'i school, the factor is that Al Azhar University, uh, their syllabus is based on that. And if, and if you go back to the lecture I did on this topic in semester one, I have links there to, to go back and look at the Katawa. Uh, the, the scholars, uh, that, that's the definition. That's what the Ulama have said. And if people have a problem with it, what what I don't know. Um, that's and that definition broad. Right? I was saying any of the four methods, which everyone you want after the four, pick which everyone you want. And Akida, the Sha'ira, the Tuhiya, and the Hamilis or Ethelis, who are very much just them. Pick which everyone you want. Then. And to solve any to solve you want. Show me a more broader <coughs> definition of Ahl Sunnah. All the way for the Quran and the Sunnah. According to who? According to who? According to uh, uh, our Sheikh. Or uh, five Sheikhs from 
last century, and one shape from the seventh century. You tell me which is more broader, which is more encompassing, and which ones the Rabbi Nah can agree upon. So the definition of Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah is a wide, broad, generous definition that, mashallah, Yishmil al Kul. Man Allah al Yishmil. Next question, go ahead. In the hadith, the, the caliph is 30 years, then it will be kingship. Um, we're going to talk about that, about the next class, uh, we're going to talk about the fiqh, I'm going to talk about the hadith. There's a whole bunch of hadith I'm going to mention about the hadith. Maybe your question will be answered. Uh, I'll ask you anyway. The, the question is, um, like, if you... If you're like on the weird ends of social media, you might come across some people saying, Oh, we need a caliphate right now. We need a caliphate. We need a caliphate. But if the Prophet said that, you know, like. On the, what's it? On the weird what? Weird side of social media. Weird side. <laughs> I mean, if you're there, you, side. you see that, you see the that. Fringe, right? If you get that on your feed, then, you know what I mean? <laughs> but. Okay, so what I mean is that. 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 They'll say that, you know, we want a caliphate right now. The Muslims should all unite, this and that. But like. Um, if the Prophet وسلم, said that the caliphate is for 30 years only, who are we? He doesn't say 30 years only. There's another hadith <coughs> we'll talk about uh, uh, next week, the week after, inshallah, uh, which the, uh, the Prophet spoke about um, before uh, phases of leadership, and the Prophet refers them by specific names. And at the end, not ISIS, how they said, but on the prophetic way. Not ISIS, how they said, but on the How should we feel about that? If, if a group of people are saying a caliphate needs to be here right now, how should we as. I've been hearing this since when I was your age. And people at my age, when I was back then, were hearing it before them. This whole thing about Khilafah, um, yes, I had a thought of, but how? How are you going to do that? How are you going to establish that? And more importantly, our Prophet told us that it will come back. The Khilafah will return uh, to the Mahdi. That's why the Ahl Nasr will return. Before that was. It was. And it happens. You're going to say ISIS doesn't count. ISIS, Khilaf doesn't count. The same as the Khawarij. They, we're going to hold back about the Khawarij as well. They didn't count either. They don't count because nobody recognized them. Despite them claiming to be from Quraysh, and that daddy, the leader of ISIS, claimed to be from um, Khadir from Ahl al-Bayt. He may well have been, Allah Alam. But the point is that all the conditions were met. Kind of a group like people on this over there. We are Ahl al-Hilm and we are We represent the whole Ummah. Nobody knows where you guys come from. Uh, or escape from prison. Now you guys want to tell us what to do with the rest of the world. No. You are rubbish. No one's going to accept it. Right? So, yeah, yeah, so... Uh, our like feeling about it is to just like, just chill. Just chill and cool. <laughs> our feeling, our feeling towards that is that see the ice off you're trying to, the work you're trying to do an ice off. They are uh, um, setting the foundations for the future. Yeah. If you understand what you're doing, what is the Isaac principle thing? To connect you with Allah. Yeah. To do that work. Okay? To connect you with Allah. Once people's hearts are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then yeah, these things come. In the meantime, people's hearts are disconnected from Allah, these things will never come. <coughs> never come, I don't expect it. And these um, calls for Khilafah, <coughs> I've heard 20 odd years back and more, those same people who were shouting it back then, right now, either are not practicing or left Islam. Or have come back to Ahl al and Jamaah. But in fact, they are, they realize this doesn't make any sense. We'll call it the khilaf, the khilaf, the khilaf. It has to be now. It's not that easy. And we have to start. The starting point is a lot more further back than most of us like to admit. We can't even pray for them. You can't even agree on Ramadan. How are we going to agree on the khilaf? 
Uh, so the, the Omer is so divided now, it's when you want, I can't got fit 20 years of some of you guys. Even now, I'm still, I understand just how divided the Omer is. Every five years or so, I get a deeper understanding of just how divided the Omer is right now. And I used to think I understood how divided it was when I was your age. I really didn't. I knew it was, but I didn't really appreciate how divided it is. Okay, I mean, Allah will preserve his being. And things are going up all the time. And you'll see that uh, in the following lecture, inshallah. Uh, so let me see that. I'll say it for another day. And I'll just do that. I've been locked twice today. Um, the conditions for appointing a caliph, uh, caliph. Is that Shafi school uh, specifically? Uh, is it's definitely the Shafi school. I'm not sure about the others. That's your homework. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> is it Muhammad's name? Muhammad? Mubah. Furghan. Father. What was the most recent realization you had with keeping your understanding of how divided the Omer is? Very deep question. Um, Are we still recording? Yeah. Okay. That's cut the recording. <laughs> <laughs>